The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. We have the beautiful mission of Spiritu Santo, the campgrounds that are just gorgeous, lots of wildlife. It's a lot of fun. I think it's prudent to learn as much as we can before these owls become threatened or even rare. If I get a critter, I don't stop until I get it down to genus and species. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. Goliad State Park and Historic Site is a really special place. We have a really nice blend of history as well as natural resources. The park has camping, places to go hiking, biking, canoeing, paddling, as well as the uh, history which it's mostly known for. Probably around five or six o'clock, church bell rings again. Everyone went back to church one more time. That was, again, completely different for the Native Americans. A whole new experience. This is a 18th century Spanish mission, one of the first efforts by Europeans to colonize Texas. Besides being introduced to Catholicism, the natives were introduced to all different types of Spanish living. That wall is original as well, all the way around. When the mission was at its peak, there were about 300 people living here, and those were mainly natives uh, housed within these walls. The missions at Goliad lasted 81 years, closing in 1830. The buildings eventually fell into disrepair, and much of the wood and stone from the site was salvaged by local residents. The property was acquired by the state in 1931, and a year later, the first of many restoration efforts were begun. We have the historic Mission Espiritu Santo de Zuniga, uh, dating back to 1749. We have Mission Rosario, which is about four miles outside of downtown Goliad. This was the bell tower. Rosario would have been very similar to what you see here at Espiritu Santo. It was never quite as successful. But when they did an excavation here, what they found was a lot of little pieces of painted plaster. The mission compound was never developed to the extent that this was. And so when you visit there, you're only going to see the ruins of the mission buildings. You'll see the outlines of all the different rooms that were there. It's uh, really quite interesting to go visit Rosario and, and see the similarities and the differences between the, the activities at both sites. Goliad is also the birthplace of General Ignacio Zaragoza. Born at the nearby community of La Bahia in 1829, Zaragoza led the Mexican army in the Battle of Puebla. On May 5, 1862, General Zaragoza's outnumbered forces defeated the occupying French army, a date now celebrated as Cinco de Mayo. Many of our visitors come here specifically to see Mission Espiritu Santo. And then they stumble upon the fact that we have beautiful campgrounds in our park and a lot of nature. These are called our Eastern Lubber Grasshoppers, Spanish Dagger. This is called the Anakwa tree. We have beautiful nature trails where our park rangers will do guided tours on the weekend. It's a hog nose. He's smashing himself out and, and making himself wider to look bigger right now. You should never try this, okay, because I'm a professional park ranger. I know what I'm doing. We do have a beautiful biking trail called the Angel of Goliad Hike and Bike Trail. It connects downtown Goliad, which is historic in itself. It goes all the way through the park and then connects to Presidio La Bahia just down the road from us. There you go. Got it. 
and we have the San Antonio River Trail. It's a real natural, undeveloped trail. It's great to be able to see the river. One of the other special things we have is we're on the Goliad Paddling Trail, which is located on the San Antonio River. It's about 6.1 miles of a beautiful, pristine river. The river has always been one of the main draws of this part of Goliad. There's a lot of evidence that it was inhabited by native groups well before any of the Europeans had arrived here. And so when the Spaniards came to this area, they recognized it as a good place to build the mission as well. You really get a good sense of the history here because we have so much of the site intact. Here you have the entire perimeter wall. You have a more or less uh, natural landscape surrounding the mission. So you really get a good sense of what it would have been like to live and work here all those years. I think the thing I love the most about this park is it is a small, peaceful park. We have a little bit of everything here. We have the San Antonio River, the beautiful mission of Espiritu Santo, the campgrounds that are just gorgeous, lots of wildlife. It's just a blend of everything that you don't find at other parks. It's a lot of fun. Shopping strips and homes and urban expansion. It's growing just like every other place in Sunbelt areas. Urban El Paso is expanding. There's about 700,000 people in the county and we are adjacent to Mexico, Juarez, where there's at least two million people. But as more people make this region home, some other desert dwellers are being displaced. Among them are burrowing owls. The other one's still in the tree. Fortunately, biologist Lois Ballin is looking out for the owls. They are endangered in several other states, but not in Texas. Right now, they're a species of concern here. They're endangered in Canada and a threatened species in Mexico. So it would be good to have a good plan for them before these owls become threatened or even rare. Burrowing owls don't live like most owls. These are terrestrial owls that live underground. These birds also borrow their burrows. They need natural areas where there are other animals like badgers or ground squirrels, rock squirrels, or prairie dogs. With the desert being encroached by urbanization, they're just losing more and more of their natural habitat. The good news is these owls can take advantage of unnatural habitat. It means I'm really not very happy that you're here. Along the Mexican border, at a natural area in eastern El Paso, Lois has been building artificial burrows for the owls since 2006. Here are some supplies you're going to need to make a burrowing owl nest box. Uh, the dog is optional. Get out of here. Stand up. A reasonable sized nest box, probably 16 inches high. And then we have pipes coming out, PVC pipes. That's their burrow. The whole idea here is designing the perfect, hopefully, artificial nest site for the owls that will enhance their success. All that has to be underground. OK, there you go. That will be the top. Makes it a lot faster when you have help. OK, you got it there. With her volunteer crews, Lois has installed 16 artificial burrows here. A little off. And building the burrows has presented an opportunity to study the owls more closely. So this is the camera right here. So right under this bucket is the nest box. The rocks discourage anybody from their curiosity in case the signs aren't enough. <laughs> Two owl homes have been fitted with video surveillance systems. It's just a little camera. Three nice large solar panels providing the energy. And this little gadget here is called a solar charge controller. And this is the DVR that's going to record all the data. And having the cameras underground gives a 
biologists a lot of new tools. It's pretty awesome. Maybe the most impressive gadget transmits the video wirelessly, so Lois can check on the birds without disturbance or a drive across town. Okay, look at this here. These are newly hatched, and they're just little white powder puffs, I'd say one day old. Not surprisingly, the cameras are revealing much about the hidden lives of burrowing owls. Number of eggs laid, number of nestlings, their behavior or their prey items. This one looks like it might be foraging. Another mouse. They have a pretty wide variety of diet, but the main staple is rodents. They also eat birds, frogs, and lizards, and even a snake. Lois is also learning how the owls can become prey themselves. I have had coach whips go into the burrows, but fortunately the owls were smart enough not to go anywhere near that snake. I went to check a nest box, which at one point had eight eggs in it. And when I checked it, there were no eggs and there was a snake skin left behind. Probably a gopher snake ate all the eggs and then decided that was a good place to shed. But the skunk discovery is the most recent, rather astonishing discovery. Skunks are going into the burrows and occupying them, and in some cases, preying on the owls themselves. It was a shocking discovery to learn that a striped skunk would eat a burrowing owl. But this has happened two or three times now. So this is another aspect to the design of the burrows. Now I have to address how do I exclude skunks. We'll find something. Information is gathered from cameras underground with the owls, as well as from cameras outside, both artificial and natural burrows. But some kinds of knowledge can only come from hands-on research. Today, we are going to try to capture some owls and ban them. Among other things, leg bands can reveal if the same owls return each year and how long they live. I'd like to catch these guys because I know they're both adults. There's a much higher rate of survival if they've made it to adulthood. Okay. Traps are placed over burrow exits and checked throughout the morning. It's just sort of random when you're going to catch them. There have been days I have uh, captured nothing, so any capture is a good one. We know that they hunt at night, um, but they also hunt during the day. And I also know from my videotape that they nap. So I think they're more nappers. The owls spend an awful lot of time preening and preening each other. Lots of uh, wing stretching, and leg stretching, and bobbing up and down when they sense danger. And their antics are just adorable. Hours after being set, the traps remain empty. No owls. They took the morning off. But before the day is done. We got one. Success. Do you hear that bill clattering? Not a happy camper. So we'll just take the whole trap back. None of them are happy to be trapped, but I try to be as quick as I can. When you see them at a distance, they look large and they're all puffed up. And then when you get them in your hand, you see how tiny they are. Well, this is not always graceful. I cover them first, and now he won't be afraid. Are there migrating owls just migrating through? Are there owls that come here just to breed? With an ID number, I can determine that information. So this fella is 74. 131.2, 165 on the wing One is 76. Lois collects her data quickly. This bird's ready to go. And the owl is soon on its way. There, look at that. The longer this research continues, the more it reveals about the secret lives of burrowing owls. 
But these owls are already increasing awareness about this urban desert habitat and the web of interconnected creatures that call it home. It's really important in a desert environment that there are these oases for wildlife. Part of our mission is to get people outside enjoying nature. So the owl is like a representative. Some biologists call them Hollywood animals. This is a very charismatic animal that people are very attracted to. People see an owl up close and they get appreciation for the owls and the habitat. While further research may be the best way to ensure these owls will always have a place to call home, this bird has come back two years in a row. Some extra care and compassion. Good information. Can't hurt. OK, baby. OK. It's very difficult to work with any animal and not become attached to them, even though there's really no relationship with the owls. Just watching them grow up and watching their behavior and their antics. Definitely, I'm very fond of them. This project was funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife Restoration Program. This right here is a lesser electric ray, and its genus species name is Narcine bancrofti, black-tailed moray eel, gymnothorax pulpos. This is called a sooty eel, Bascanichthys bascanium. <laughs> I actually collected this one off the beach. It burrows in the, straight down into the sand, it stuck its head up, I grabbed it and started pulling and it just kept coming up and up and up. Should I put this down? <laughs> I've been working for Texas Parks and Wildlife for 33 and a half years. I got a call from somebody at our Seabrook office and he said, do you know your fish? I said, well, yeah, I know them very well. He says, do you know how to run a boat? I said, yes, I do. He said, can you start Monday? I was like, sure. And I hung up and I thought, I don't even know where Seabrook is. I don't know what I've just done. But uh, that was my interview for this position and I've been in it ever since. Brenda is very knowledgeable about identifying marine species. She's very well known for that. A lot of people rely on those skills to uh, identify various species that we're not sure what they are. Can't make good management decisions to protect the natural resources unless we know what we have out in the water. When we go out to sample, you have to know what it is that you're collecting in that gear. That's a great barracuda. That is an alligator gar, southern flounder, bluefish, black drum, blunt-nosed jack, hyphen goby, hog choker, leather jack, sheep's head minnow, moonfish, pigfish, henfish, ladyfish, sea cucumbers. Most people don't care what kind it is. I do. If I get a critter, I don't stop until I get it down to genus and species. Around 2004, I was trying to get everybody to identify what we have correctly because that makes our data so much better. And she came up with some ideas to take pictures of dead fish. And then she moved from there to, well, let's make it a field guide for the staff to share. And she you know, pulled pictures together and was like, let's take it a step further. So about five years, she had built up about 500 pictures. I had too much to put in a book. So I decided maybe a website would be best. I got a book and the internet, and I looked up how to build a website. It's been a very useful tool for not only people within the division, but people in the public. In fact, all across the country, go to her website to find out about fish. And so she's really provided more than just a tool for the agency and for the staff, but she's provided a wonderful outreach component. And it's just, it's been a lot of work on her part. And no one said, you've got to do this. It was something she's passionate about and something that she worked for. I enjoy sharing that information with not only our people, with the public, and they really seem to appreciate it. So I will continue this even after I retire because I'm never going to stop. Like most families, the Gibsons in Bastrop, Texas lead busy lives. There's homework I want you to read this one to me. and homeschool, Visual. a busy management job, 
and lots of new words to learn. But a few times a year, the Gibsons take a break from their busy lives nice. and get yeah, even nice. busier. Okay, everybody all set? Yep. They volunteer for the Texas Parks and Wildlife Coastal Expo. 3,000 kids come out over two days to learn about the natural world. It's almost a little bit of an adrenaline rush. See you happy right over there. Our main goal is to get them in and paint fish, not themselves. And then you just pull the rope in. I'd say it's probably about 60 to 70% of the kids that come through there have never either been fishing, they've never been to the coast. Once you start learning. Throw it out there. Not only yourself, but teaching other kids. Who wants to go first? It gets really fun. You can develop a habit of teaching people instantly. If they don't show up, we'll get as much of your class through. It's exciting. It is hard work, but we get so much more out of it than what we really put into it. I absolutely cannot do Expo without volunteers. If we didn't have volunteers like the Gibsons, we wouldn't be able to reach all the kids and provide those first-time experiences outdoors. You know, their faces lighting up when they get to touch a crab or see an alligator or catch a fish for the first time. We've become very good friends over the years. Good job. So watching the kids grow up and uh, become these amazing adults has been a lot of fun. There you go. They've learned how to supervise and how to be good leaders. As soon as we have a wave go down, just pick them all up and wash them as fast as you can. I'm not a very mousy person. I tend to be quiet and soft-spoken. Just a little bit. I think it looks awesome. I'm volunteering. I'm a completely different person. And then you take it and throw it out. Look at that. I get a lot more out of it than just sitting at a computer or Xbox for an hour. Awesome. I get 100% more out of it. Olivia's first expo, she was 17 weeks. And this year's, she's participating. Or she'll go visit with the master naturalists and play with the tortoises, or she's learning the words of the stuff at the beach goodies table. Do you know another word for it? Kids are gonna find value in what you find value in. If you're on the couch 24-7 watching whatever it is on TV, they're gonna follow suit. We try to get our kids out, get them engaged, get them plugged into the outside. This is what we do. The Gibson family first started volunteering at Bastrop State Park. It allowed us to really have that quality time with our kids. It's fun, it's purposeful, but we get to do it as a family. So when Chad and Dorianne decided to renew their wedding vows, they returned to the park that held so many family memories. Kind of figured that was fitting, seeing how that's where we kind of started all of this. It's really a part of the fabric of our family life. You may kiss. <laughs> Every hour is worth volunteering when you see the kids get happy. Awesome. You can't put a price on coming home and going, that was so much fun, that was really cool. Working as a team brings our family together a whole bunch. <laughs> Just do it, don't overthink it. It's so much fun. <laughs>
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels. Over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.